Today is Sunday, September the 1st. The summer is over. And in two days' time, I'm going to go back to university for my very final semester at this institution. I went down to Vancouver to see if I could locate all of my books for the upcoming semester. But as you can see by the title, this is not a university reading list video, which hopefully will be coming shortly. This is actually an unexpected book haul video because what I had intended to do was to go to the shop to buy the books I need. I don't want to tell you what they are right now because then that will spoil the next video. So what did you do? Did you just turn around and go home and, and say, well, congratulations, Grant, you went to a used bookstore and you didn't spend any money? Is that what you think happened? No, that is not what happened. I still came home with a pile of books. For some people, this would be even a year's worth of reading. Now, God knows when I'm gonna get around to reading these books, but I've got them. Let's begin. This comes from The Paper Hound, an excellent used bookstore in Vancouver. They really have such a wonderful collection of literature. They've got excellent stuff and really good quality books. Like, even though they are used, they're not used, they're, they're almost always brand spanking new and the shop is beautiful and I love to go in there because it just has such a an ambiance. Let's see what I bought. Some prefer nettles by Yunichiro Tanizaki. It is in the 1920s in Tokyo and Kaname and his wife Misako are trapped in a parody of a progressive western marriage. Good. What did I read by Tanizaki? Oh the the Makioka sisters, of course. No longer attracted to each other, they have long since stopped sleeping together, and Kaname has sanctioned his wife's liaisons with another man. But at the heart of their arrangement lies a sadness that impels Kaname to take refuge in the past in the serene rituals of the classic puppet theater, hmm, and in a growing fixation with his father-in-law's mistress. My. Some Prefer Nettles is an ethereal, suggestive, psychologically complex exploration of the crisis every culture faces as it hurtles headfirst into modernity. Tanizaki, well, I've read two. I've read the, the Makioka Sisters, which was easily one of my favorite books of all time. And then I read another book of his that was very short, that was very weird. Confessions of a Dirty Old Man, or The Diary of a Dirty Old Man. You get what it says on the cover. It is the diary of a dirty old man who is becomes infatuated with his daughter-in-law. I just pulled it right off the shelf. I didn't see this ridiculous cover. Why would they make a cover like that? Like that is, see, and that book is really in fine condition. How much was this? $10, oh, a big spender. And this next one, I almost fell over when I saw this one. The next book I'm about to show you is my favorite Hungarian novel. I never thought I would find this book in Canada. I was shocked. I thought I was going to have to order this one. Well, just show it to us, Grant. Don't be so goddamn roundabout. Antal Serb, Journey by Moonlight. Or in Hungarian, uh, Serb Antal Utas Esh Hodvilag. Have you ever read a book that just, it, it feels that it's magical in the way that it captures your interest and the tale begins unspooling across the pages. Page upon page, it is so fascinating that you just don't want to look away. That is this book. On the train, everything seemed fine. The trouble began in Venice with the back alleys. Mihai first noticed the back alleys when the motor ferry turned off the Grand Canal for a shortcut and they began appearing to right and left. But at the time he paid them no attention, being caught up from the outset with the essential Venice-ness of Venice. The water between the houses, the gondolas, the lagoon, and the, the pink brick serenity of the city. For it was Mihai's first visit to Italy at the age of 36 on his honeymoon. During his protracted years of wandering, he had traveled in many lands and spent long periods in France and England. But Italy he had always avoided, feeling the time had not yet come, that he was not yet ready for it. Italy he associated with grown-up matters, such as the fathering of children, and he secretly feared it with the same instinctive fear he had of strong sunlight, the scent of flowers, and extremely beautiful women. What an opening. What an absolute, right away, throwing out the, the character, the, the weird psychology of a 36-year-old man on honeymoon who 
feared Italy, but now he's going there because he's a married man and he wants to prove that he's brave to himself at least. So amazing. If you could ever find this book. A couple of months ago, I asked my Hungarian friends if they would give me their recommendations for what they thought were the best Hungarian books. And I was planning to make a video on that. And now that I have this, I probably will. So I shouldn't speak about this one too much because this, for me, this is Hungarian literature. There are a lot of other books, but this is the pinnacle. So that neatly spoils that next Hungarian video. You don't have to watch that one now, if I ever get around to making it. These books come from McLeod Bookstore, which is just a little bit down the street from the Paper Hound. The stores could not be more polar opposites. The Paper Hound is beautiful emporium. You know, the lighting is soft. There's some furniture, stacks of books, books piled up neatly. There's no dust. Everything is carefully placed on the shelf. And McLeod's books is, well, if you had several book hoarders who were all sharing the same space, there are hills of books. Here is the literature hill. There is the photography hill. There's apparently even a whole basement filled with history books that I didn't even know there was a basement. And sometimes they are inundated with so many people bringing in their books. There are some passages that are almost hard to get through. A fat person would not be able to navigate some of the aisles between the book stacks. Like there was this one little corner that I wanted to get to um, right at the, the beginning of the literature section, you know, A and B. I, I had to take off my backpack and hold it above my head so that I could narrowly squeeze through the passage. I didn't want to topple over this hill of books that were precariously piled up everywhere. McLeod Books, it's nice because it looks, you know that there's going to be dozens of treasures. It's just that you have to dig them out. Like they could not hire enough employees to get all of the books onto the shelves. Usually there is the bookshelves and on the floor there is another pile of books that are just stacked up because they have so many books. If you're not near Vancouver and you have no idea what I'm talking about, you should just check some photos because the place is ridiculous. But they do have good stuff. And I spent 38, 32. How did that happen? See, I've never been able to figure out how they are allowed to charge tax on used books. As I was saying, I was looking for Balzac and I found this one. Ursula Murouet. An essentially simple tale about the struggle and triumph of innocent reviled. What? Try again. An essentially simple tale about the struggle and triumph of innocence reviled. Someone will have to explain that to me. Ursula Mirouet is characterized by that wealth of penetrating observation so readily associated with Balzac's work. Oh, good. The twin themes of redemption and rebirth are illuminated by a consistently passionate rejection of both philosophical and practical materialism in favor of love. Love. In this case, love is aided by supernatural intervention, which itself effectively illustrates Balzac's lifelong fascination with the occult. I think seven dollars, but quite perfect condition. Did you see dust come up when I did that? That's from McLeod Books. It's a dusty store. I think I need to stop buying books by Balzac because I already have two or even three books that are still as yet unread on the shelf and I just keep buying more. And of course, who's the guy who always goes along with Balzac? Emile Zola. The debacle. The debacle which charts in vivid detail the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 is Zola's only purely his historical work. France had waged war with many European countries since the revolution, but Napoleon III's declaration of war against Prussia in 1870 was an outrageous act of provocation that eventually brought about the collapse of the correct, corrupt Second Empire. In this extraordinarily accurate, authentic account of France's defeat, Zola has drawn on a great deal of personal research on weapons, strategies, and tactics to give the most comprehensive chronicle of the war ever created. Wow and I'm on a big war kick in 2024, but I've already read my Zola for this year. Still, nice to have, $5. Man, when you buy those old books and they've got, they really wanted to put a lot of words on the page. Didn't want to waste any paper. No. If you're a long time watcher of my channel, last year, or maybe even longer ago, I started going through the Modern Library's 100 Greatest English Written Novels of the 20th Century. And recently, which is to say probably the last six months, I've been quite stuck because I wanted to find this book.
the bridge of San Luis Rey. And I had a hell of a time finding it. It was really difficult to find a copy of this book because I would like to do an entire video just on this book, this very short, amazing novel. Like one of the shortest novels you're ever going to read, but like one of the most perfectly written. And I haven't read it for a very long time. And I started to feel a bit of a compulsion, uh, compunction. I would like my list videos to be a little bit better quality. I was a bit disappointed with some of the videos. So I've decided to try to put in a little bit more work, which meant finding a copy of this and reading it so I can make a better video because just holding up a book and saying very banal things about it that don't really offer you any insight. I don't see a great deal of value in that. It's nice that you're still watching and please don't click to another video immediately. But you see what I'm getting at, right? That I want to, I want you to read these books and I want to be able to explain why I think they are worth your time and effort and money to get this book and to make the effort to read it. So just to hold it up and say, yeah, I read it 20 years ago. It's good. You should give it a try. I mean, that's nothing. So I'm going to try to, to do a little bit better with the list books. The trouble with being a, a book tuber, I, I, I cannot accept that title, with being a YouTube person who talks about books is that it's, yeah, it's time consuming to read a lot of books. Oh, well, don't complain, you dumbass. You've got over a thousand subscribers, huh? Jesus Christ. Bridge of San Luis Rey. So wonderful. I'll talk about it more in time. Hey, another Yunichiro Tanizaki. The key. I found this weird little edition. Nice, that old stuff, huh? Come on, you can see your little tits. The key tells the story of a middle-aged professor with an obsessive fear of losing his sexual vigor, who f frenziedly, frenziedly tries to arouse Ikuko his wife of 30 years, by resorting to various stimulants and finally to jealousy and voyeurism. They record their separate reactions and diaries whose interweaving recounts the steady pathological decline of their diseased physical rapport. Before his death a few years ago, okay, Tanizaki was one of the most frequently mentioned candidates for the Nobel Prize in Literature. His style in the novel has been compared by critics to that of André Guidé. As I was saying about some prefer nettles, Makioka Sisters is this sprawling epic tale of these four sisters and the lives they lead and how they make a family. The Diary of a Dirty Old Man is more vulgar, more, you know, an old man who's losing his wits. And I suspect this is more on that side. New Year's Day. This year I intend to begin writing freely about a topic which, in the past, I've hesitated even to mention here. I've always avoided commenting on my sexual relations with Ikiko for fear that she might surreptitiously read my diary and be offended. I dare say she knows exactly where to find it, but I've decided not to worry about that anymore. Of course, her old-fashioned Kyoto upbringing has left her with a good deal of antiquated morality. Indeed, she rather prides herself on it. It seems unlikely that she would dip into her husband's private writings. However, that is not altogether out of the question. If now, for the first time, my diary becomes cheaply cons chiefly concerned with our sexual life, will she be able to resist the temptation? By nature, she is furtive, fond of secrets, constantly holding back and pretending ignorance. Worst of all, she regards that as feminine modesty. Even though I have several hiding places for the key to the locked drawer, where I will keep this book. Such a woman may well have searched out all of them. For that matter, you could easily buy a duplicate of the key. 1960, 127 pages. A note about the translator. Howard Hibbett, Hibbett, H-I-B-B-E-T-T, -T, took his doctorate at Harvard in Japanese literature and lived in Japan for three years. He has taught at the University of California and is now associate professor of Japanese literature at Harvard. Thank you, Hibbett for translating this book. Hibbit, Hibbit, Hibbit. Oh, found a good one. Little Man, What Now? by Hans Falada. Written just before the Nazis came to power, this darkly enchanting novel tells the simple story of a young couple trying to eke out a decent life amidst an economic crisis that's transforming their country into a place of anger and despair. It was an international bestseller upon its release and made into a Hollywood movie by Jewish producers which prompted the rising Nazis to begin paying ominously close attention to Hans Falada 
even as his novels held out stirrings of hope for the human spirit. There's the other Falada over there, the drinker. I read that uh, last year, maybe, or it was a while ago. And that is um, a weird, heartbreaking novel about a man who becomes a thorough alcoholic, the levels of hell that he's descending to very quickly. And it was a great novel, extremely well written, very, very fast paced. I'm expecting something a little bit more slow paced in this one, maybe a bit more reflective, but I don't know. Hans Falada was a really peculiar character, had a lot of trouble with alcohol and drugs, real, pure Falada sentiment. So those, one, two, three, four, five, five books, $40, ah, I guess so. And then I went to my favorite used bookstore in New Westminster, and this Orange Crush Velvet used bookstore has the best used books I've ever seen in any used bookstore. Like, it's better than The Paper Hound, a little bit smaller, like, in selection. And see, McLeod Books, there's nothing bigger than McLeod Books. Anyway, Orange Crush Velvet in New Westminster. If, um, if you're in Vancouver, I strongly suggest coming to New Westminster and just having a look at their used books. Like, the... The man who owns it, he's got a master's degree in literature, and he, man, this guy really knows what he's talking about. He knows literature. I was in there for two hours, and just one book and another book, and, and so often, like, it's very rare that I'll take a book off the shelf and say, all right, what's this one? You know, like, I, I've never heard of it. Tell me, tell me something about this. Now, not this one, though. Winesburg, Ohio, Sherwood Anderson. A couple of years ago, I ordered a copy of Winesburg, Ohio, and they sent me this piece of shit. I mean, I can't read that. I mean, look at it. It's it's already falling apart. I, I wrote to the company and I said, look, guys, I can't pay for that. Look at it. It's 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 nothing. It's nearly unreadable. Like, it, it will just fall apart in my careless hands. So I bought another copy because I'm really, really very much want to read Winesburg, Ohio again. Yeah, so I'm happy I got that one. I'll do a book lottery at the end of this if, if you would like this. Oh, what a shitty prize, though, after just saying how awful it is. And now I'm going to say I'm going to give it away. So here we go with Orange Crush Velvet and me saying, you know, I see that and I pull it off and I see this and I say, um, what's this? And he's like, yeah, that's a good one. You should get that one. I said, all right. Apparently it is dispatches of a journalist from Vietnam, from the war. That is all he told me and that was enough. I, I need to read something about Vietnam. And then this one was the wild one. So. For some reason, I've been seeing this name quite a lot recently. I don't know if you know this character, but I've his name keeps popping up. It must be the SKV that really appeals to me. Joseph Skvorecki. Skvorecki, the engineer of human souls. Never heard of it, don't know a single thing about it. What can I say? I like those East European names. You know, they, they always look so tantalizing to me. I said, is this good? He said, man, that's good. I said, all right, okay, good enough. Danny Smiriki is a Czech writer who fled his country in 1968 to find asylum in the sheltered world of Edenvale College in Toronto. Hmm. His new world is an Eden, which he sees with old world eyes. That's why I bought it, because I think it, there will be quite a lot of reflection from when I came, you know, when I left Hungary after 16 years and I came back to Canada and how it all seems so very strange to me. I think I've got used to it now, eight years later, but there's still quite a lot about Canada that is just so peculiar. He is touched and exasperated by its political innocence. <laughs> yes. Riley amused by the hilarious counter-revolutionary schemes of his fellow emigres, tormented by the Soviet secret agents who dog his footsteps, and he succumbs to the determined flirtations of his prettiest student. Mm -mm. At the same time, he is undone by memories of a homeland as lost to him as his youth, of Nadia, the factory girl who was his first lover, of his career as a girl chaser and feckless hero of the resistance in small bohemian village under the pall of the Nazi occupation and later under Stalin, a world of heroes, traitors, and innocents. Yeah, $12 wasn't cheap. But I think this is really a rare book that's hard to find. I don't really like it when a book starts with that many quotations. Like, that seems a bit... Um, you know, choose one. I don't really like this edition. The paper is a bit um, kind of rough and raw. I certainly won't be able to read this one in the bath. And then two more quotations to start the first chapter. That's... All right, so chapter one, called Poe. Outside the window, which is high, narrow, and gothic, the cold Canadian wind blends 
two whitenesses, snowflakes sifting down from lowering clouds and snow dust lifted and whirled by the wind from the land stretching southwards to Lake Ontario. The snow swirls through a white wasteland broken only by a few bare, blackened trees. That is Toronto for sure. Toronto is a weird place. Um, Canadian people really, you are either a Toronto person or you're not in terms of being Canadian. And if you're a Toronto person, then you're, you're really proud and smug and you're, ah, I'm in Toronto, I'm in the best city in the whole country. And everyone else, everywhere else, hates Toronto people <laughs> because of this attitude, like, oh, they think they're the best. It's weird, these little attitudes people have. And, and Vancouver people, well, Vancouver people are laid back and relaxed because they smoke marijuana all the time, but they're also healthy because they go hiking every day as well. So that's, that's the image of Vancouver people. Smoking weed, going hiking, healthy and laid back. And Montreal people, well, they're French, you know. French Canadian, Montrealer, enjoys more than just, you know, having a nice Du Maurier cigarette, drinking a ice cold Pepsi, putting on Michael Jackson's Thriller and dancing around like a lunatic. And those French Canadian girls, not that I want to get myself in trouble here, but they're unlike girls in other parts of the country. The French Canadian Quebec girls. Well, if you don't have any experience, it's worth taking a trip to Montreal or Quebec City, which is the most beautiful city in Canada. Quebec City. When I came back to Canada after Budapest, I wanted to live in Quebec City, but I don't speak French. That's my tragedy, among others. Already the economy in Quebec City is not very good. For someone to go there without any French, it's basically a death sentence. You will not get a job. So I had to come out here to Vancouver. Quebec City is, that's the place where I would really like to live in Canada, if everything were ideal. If I had money, if I spoke French, I would definitely settle in Quebec City. Those are the books that I bought instead of the university books that I should have bought. What a foolish person I am. Oh, well, how much did I spend? $60? But I got some good reading there, eh? All right, we won't do a book lottery, but I'll tell you what, if you write to me at Gmail, grantlovesbooks at gmail.com. I'll mail you this, and I'll mail you this for free. Just write to me and say, Grant, this is my mailing address. I love your videos. You are an absolute god among men. Please, would you send me those? And I'll send them to you for watching the video all the way to the end. All right, so write to me. I'll mail you these, okay? All right, there you go. That's the end of the video. <laughs> I, ran, I ran out of energy. Take care. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go.